Hey everyone, welcome to The Net Online. We're so glad to have you here. We're going to start off the message with a short video clip for you to enjoy. After the message, don't forget to subscribe to our channel for future updates and messages, and leave a comment because we love hearing from you. Thanks for joining. Oh, Mr. Miyagi, I forgot to give this back to you last night. Uh, you keep. Oh, thanks a lot. So, ready? Well, yeah, I guess so. And your son must talk. Walk on the road. Hmm? Walk right side, safe. Walk left side, safe. Walk middle, sooner or later, get a squish, just like grip. Here, karate, same thing. Either you karate do yes, or karate do no. You karate do guess so. Just like grip. Understand? Yeah, I understand. Now ready? Yeah, I'm ready. Yes. Let's make sacred pact. I promise teach karate, that to my part. You promise learn. I say you do, no question, that to your part. Deal? Steal. Yes. First wash all the car, then wax. Wax. Wait, why do I have to wash all the car? Remember, deal. No question. Yeah, but I... Right. <laughs> Wax on, right hand. Wax off, left hand. Wax on, wax off. Breathe in through nose, out the mouth. Wax on, wax off. Don't forget to breathe. Very important. Wax on, wax off. Wax on. Off. Hey, where these cars come from? Wax on. Detroit! Wax off. Wax on. Wax off. Wax on, wax off. So often people want to begin their walk with the Lord, or they, or they want to come into a church environment or a discipleship environment, and they're real eager, they're real excited, and then to find out that a lot of what's involved in beginning to put roots down and begin to grow in the Lord involves the mundane. It's kind of a rude awakening when you find out that it sometimes begins with things like being on time, coming to prayer, you know, things that may seem mundane to you. They may not be that exciting, but I'm showing you that clip because it dovetails into this message that we're doing today on the names of God about what it means to follow Jesus as our Lord and so, uh, but before we, before we get into that message, I want to make a comment uh, on, a, on a personal note. I see you out there, Matt Johnson. And uh, is Kate here with you today? Oh, okay. All right. So, so I was going to say it's there. It, well, it's essentially their last Sunday here today. She may be watching online right now, but we're very sad. Uh, Matt got a really awesome... Uh, Navy, Navy assignment to the Dallas area, and this is their last Sunday today, and so we're really glad to see you today, Matt. And uh, but Matt, Matt has been a their family has has been a blessing to us, and he really was here. He they came. He had a three year assignment here in Corpus Christi, and, and it was a very kind of profound leading to come to this church because. They were weighing, what do we do? We're back in Corpus. You know, where do we go? What do we do? And they, they were just thinking, you know, paths of least resistance. But as they were thinking about it, praying about it, they felt like, no, we need, to, we need to approach this differently this time. And so we were at an air show. This is the coolest thing. They were, we were at an air show. There were probably 20,000 people at this air show. And I was going to leave early on a Saturday because I need to get ready for Sunday. And as I'm leaving, the wind is blowing really strong, as you know, in Corpus. And my hat blows off. And I'm leaving. remember, we're leaving ahead of the crowd. And my hat blows off and starts blowing down this tarmac. And as it is, I see this family with strollers and chairs, and they're carrying all this stuff. 
And this young man drops everything and goes out and starts chasing my, my hat for me. And then he picks it up and brings it back to me. And I'm like, thank you so much. I, you know, I had chairs and stuff too, but he had, a, he had his family to manage. But he went after my hat. And so the next, that next day, they're here in church. He didn't know who I, I mean, well, he did know who I was. He, he told Kate right after he talked to me and got my hat, he says, you know, he says, that's the pastor of the church that we're visiting tomorrow. So he recognized and he thought out of 20,000 people, what were the odds that that connection would be made? And, and so, and Matt serves such an important role, technical role. He's, he's a brilliant uh, technician, software, you know, technician and but he really helped us make that transition during the COVID period where technically we had a lot of challenges to get live stream up and running right away. So Matt became one of our go-to guys and um, we really appreciated you being, you know, it's like he was like there right when we needed him to be and he really, really helped us a lot. And so Matt, uh, Kate, if you're watching, we're going to miss you guys and your beautiful children, your family and love you guys. And, uh, we know things that go well. Who knows? Maybe in two years they'll circle back, huh? I don't know. I've... It can happen. All right. So, with that, uh, we are in part five of the names of God. Life-changing insights into God's character as revealed through the scripture. We're looking at the name uh, Adonai Yahweh. It means our Lord ruler of the universe, divine king. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break this down a little bit before we get into some applications. Adonai in itself, this is a compound name of God, Adonai Yahweh. And so this, this name Adonai qualifies Yahweh. We've talked about Yahweh quite a bit. It's the, it's the affectionate and personal name that God revealed himself to Israel in. And Lord... Master, ruler, owner, Adonai. The term denotes kingship. So if somebody says to someone, Lord, and they use Adonai in Hebrew, it would mean that they see them as a very high superior, high level superior, like royalty. And so it's used commonly for how God is addressed to Adonai. And he reigns. He is the one who issues royal edicts. He is the judge and we are his subjects. And so I want you to understand that if, if it was just kind of a min, min, mundane human level, it'd be Adon, just Adon, A-D-O-N. But adding I on the end, A-I, it gives it a sense of, possess, it's a possessive term, and it's a plural term. It's really interesting because Adonai used widely among the Hebrews, it, it has a plural component, but it's a singular use. Much like Elohim, a plural component, but a singular use. These interesting words, in looking at their etymology, you realize that they're expressing something about the nature and character of God. And we, we now have such a well-developed doctrine of the triune nature of God from the New Testament. But it really is there all along through the Old Testament. As you see in some of these words, are kind of it's packed in there, this idea of plurality within one person. And so... Uh, so Adonai, it, the possessive, when I say it's a possessive term, it means something more than just I'm addressing the Lord and royalty, but it means the AI added is not artificial intelligence. The AI added means possessive, meaning my Lord. So it is inherently personal. So somebody says Adonai, it means my Lord. Now, listen, your Bibles are a little confusing, and that's why I put the translations on the word God and Lord, you have to really do a lot of research, which I've done, to find out which words are what. Because in your English Bibles, for instance, um, the word Lord appears thousands of times in your Bible. But you, you have to understand that is not Adonai. Okay? Adonai only occurs, I think, what I have here. 400, let's see, do I have it listed? Yeah. Adonai only occurs 439 times in the Old Testament. So then what is the word Lord? We see thousands of times. And that's why it's confusing because Yahweh 
is translated Lord 6,800 times. Whereas the actual word for Lord, Adonai, is only translated that way. It only occurs 439 times. Elohim, the word that's translated God, is 2,600 times. So what's going on here? And how can I tell, look at my Bible, what's what? And there is a code in your Bible. And why in the world did they do that? It's because a long time ago, people had almost a superstitious, maybe kind of reverence that they cannot say the word Yahweh or however it was pronounced by the ancients. We're not actually sure, but the best rendition is Yahweh. It's the Tetragrammaton. Remember the YW8. Uh, YW, uh, I have it all over my PowerPoint. There it is, YHW. <laughs> it's on every screen. So because they felt that way, they were not going to translate it Yahweh. Or in some pronunciations, some of you may say Jehovah, but that's not right either. So out of reverence, they changed it to Lord. So that's why you see the word Lord 6,800 times. You see it over and over and over throughout your Bible. You see Lord in the Old Testament. And the majority of the time, that's Yahweh, not Adonai. And so we're going to distinguish between Lord, Adonai, and Yahweh as we keep going through this. So this compound name, Yahweh, Adonai, or Adonai, Yahweh, would be more correct. Adonai Yahweh is a compound name where it's taking Lord, my Lord, and qualifying Yahweh with my Lord, Yahweh. You follow? Okay, so. That occurs 319 times. Adonai Yahweh. My Lord, Yahweh. I think the NIV, some of these translations actually translate Adonai Yahweh, sovereign God. I mean, like, where do they get sovereign God from Adonai Yahweh? I mean, you know, I mean, the Hebrew is the Hebrew. You can't, you know, but the problem comes in because we've been finagling and doing gymnastics with translations because we have a long tradition of calling Yahweh Lord in English. It's kind of one of those unfortunate things, but it's kind of like ecclesia being translated church, which is probably rooted in the Latin circus. It's not helpful, but it mainly refers to building, not the ecclesia, who is individuals or a people that are called out for a purpose. We are the church. The building is not, see? That's the New Testament view. You know that. But it's, it's, there's a few of these. The translations are so good, and they're done so well, and so much research. But there's a few of these little glitches that are there because of deep traditions, like how we translate ecclesia, how we tra translate uh, Yahweh. Those are just two examples. So Yahweh is clarified by the word Adonai, Lord, meaning that he is Israel's Lord. He is our Lord. We serve him on a personal level. Yahweh is not impersonal. So we're going to go back to the text we were looking at last week, Genesis chapter 15. And this is the first time this word occurs in the Old Testament. We saw Dabar Yahweh last week, and today in the same text is the first time it occurs, Adonai Yahweh. So as we look, you'll see it there. After these things, the word of the Lord, Dabar Yahweh, came to Abram in a vision saying, Do not fear, Abram. I am a shield to you. Your reward shall be very great. Abram said, O Lord God, and that's Adonai Yahweh. What will you give me since I am childless? And the heir of my house is Eleazar of Damascus. And Abram said, Since you have given no offspring to me, one born in my house is my heir. Continuing Genesis 15, 4. says, Then behold, the word of the Lord, remember Debar Yahweh, came to him saying, This man will not be your heir, but one who will come forth from your own body. He shall be your heir. And he took him outside and he said, Now look toward the heavens and count the stars, and if you are able to count them. And he said to him, So shall your descendants be. Then he believed in the Lord, that is Yahweh, and he reckoned it to him as righteousness. 
And he said to him, I am the Lord, that is Yahweh, who brought you out of Ur of Chaldeans to give you this land to possess it. So what I'm wanting you to understand is when he says Adonai Yahweh, it was actually, you can't necessarily tell by just reading the English text, but it was a statement of submission on the part of Abram. He's saying, Lord Yahweh, my Lord Yahweh. So he's saying his, his first dec declaration of lordship is to Dabar Yahweh, who we talked about last week. We established that Dabar Yahweh, the word of the Lord, is Yeshua, or Jesus. Jesus is Lord. So when he acknowledges for this first time Adonai Yahweh, he is acknowledging his kingship, his right to rule in the affairs of men, his right to rule in his own affairs, Abram is saying, Lord, you are my Lord, Yahweh. He is approaching royalty fearfully and respectfully, presenting his dilemma. So I have a notable thought for you. If you're visiting today, this is my chance to quote myself. It is in the, and actually this quote is from 2016. How about that? Nostalgia kicking in. And... Um, it is in this posture of submission that Abram believed God. Believing in the Bible is not just believing the right things. It involves a submission that trusts God with our lives. A submission to His right to rule in our lives. This submission embodied His faith and His trust in God. It is biblical saving faith that is not divorced from lordship. So remember in the New Testament, this is referenced. It says, and Abram, Abraham believed God and it was reckoned or counted out to him as righteousness. So in the Bible, when it says believed God, we have to understand it can mean maybe a mental assent, but we usually in English, when we say believe something, we are not talking about the word believe in the Bible. When the Bible talks about believe, when Abram is believing God, this meant an act of trusting God. It was far more than just assenting to an idea. And today people actually think that they're saved because they assent to an idea. Oh yeah, I can check those boxes. Give me a survey, I'll tell you. I believe in Jesus, I believe in a resurrection, I believe in you know, various things, and we could lay them out. And a lot of people would maybe agree with those things. But agreeing with those things from a biblical standpoint does not make a person saved because that is not saving faith. This is so important because people are so ingrained, modern uh, Americans, modern people that, you know, that have English as their primary language, we hear the word believe and we almost can't help it, but we think it's a mental assent, we think it's a concept of agreeing with certain ideas. And that is not the concept of believe in the Bible. So when it talks about Abraham believed God and it was counted in righteousness, he is coming to Yahweh. He is coming as Adonai Yahweh. He's saying, you are my Lord and I am here to serve you. I am your subject. And I am here to obey. I am here to follow. Guide me. Advise me. Tell me what I need to do next. See, that is the attitude of a disciple. That's why I showed you the wax, on, wax off. That was more a reflection of Abram's attitude. He says, very, there's no coincidence, it's not an accident, that the scripture, that the Hebrew is Adonai Yahweh here. He's saying, my Lord Yahweh. I am subject to your lordship. I am here to serve, I'm here to follow, and I choose to believe you so what is saving faith lordship is inherent in true salvation from a biblical point of view submission is intrinsic to saving faith in other words the idea of believing in the bible is not separate or divorced from the actions that we take and the trust that we exude so we have to get past this idea that, well, I'm, I'm saved because I believe the right things. It's just not true. There's a lot of people out there that think they're saved because they supposedly believe some of the right things. But in reality, they're living in sin. They're living in rebellion. They're living uh, in immorality. 
And it's part of a, a modern day deception that somehow people can live however they want and grace will cover them. But that's not saving faith. There are many that will believe in Jesus and they'll have a mental ascent with no real transformation. And I'm convinced that the reason so many will supposedly come to Christ or come to the Lord or say, I'm a believer now, and yet there's no evidence of any life change at all, is because they've never submitted to Adonai Yahweh. They've never embraced Him as Lord in the context of their faith. So here we'll look at another example where Adonai Yahweh appears in the Old Testament. Samson, you probably know the story of Samson, but he is in a big mess. He has gotten in trouble. Delilah's already cut off his hair. He's already lost his power. He, is, he has been captured by the Philistines. They've gouged out his eyes. They've got him in a, in a mill where he's, you know, a, a laughing stock of the Philistines. And then he prays this prayer. And when Samson prays this prayer, you have to understand how significant it is, it is because he uses Adonai Yahweh this time. It says, then Samson called to the Lord Yahweh and said, O oh Lord God, Lord God is Adonai Yahweh. Please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O oh God, Elohim. So he's submitting to Elohim, who's the creator of the universe, and he's saying, I am submitted to you. He should have been submitted to him all along, or he wouldn't be in the mess that he's in. Better late than never, as they say. But his better late than never is Adonai Yahweh. I am submitting to you. I am coming and approaching you as the great high royalty of the entire universe. And I'm here and I'm submitting. I am yours. I'm, it's an expression of deep repentance on the part of Samson, a deep regret. He says, O oh Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, please remember me and please strengthen me just this time, O oh God, Elohim that I may at once be avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson gasped, grasped the two middle pillars on which the house rested and braced himself against them, and the one with his right hand and the other with his left. And Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he bent with all his might so that the house fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it so that dead whom he killed at his death, were more than those whom he killed in his life. And God responded to him, I believe, because he was approaching him as Adonai Yahweh. It was a powerful moment. This, these are not just words. This is an expression of deep consecration, of deep repentance, of a deep sense of submission to God as his king and his Lord. Samson is now placing himself back into the jurisdiction of God's kingdom. He was asking God to bring about justice against his enemy and to restore his, his intended legacy. The next example I'm going to give you is King David. Now, King David had a dilemma. Well, we know he had a number of dilemmas, but this particular dilemma was after many battles and arriving into his kingship and his place of dominance in the whole realm. It was a golden era of Israel. David had a yearning to build the temple for God. And he's praying about it, and he's saying, Lord, I, I want to build this temple. As finally, we're at, a, we're at a time of peace. We're at a time where we have resources and we have energy and focus. And it's not right that that you are dwelling in tents and I'm in a house of cedar. Let me build you a temple, a physical temple. And God, through the prophet, he's on his way to start building this temple. And the, and the prophet, everybody thought it was a great idea, but the Lord spoke to the prophet and said, no, that's not what we're doing. And he comes and brings it to David. David has this conversation with God about it. And... This is what the Lord tells David. 
And you have to understand, he's telling him something that is crushingly disappointing to David. David thought he was ready to offer this awesome gift to God. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to build, finally, for the first time in the history of Israel, we're actually going to have a physical place to worship Yahweh. So here's how it went down. He says, then David the king went in and sat before the Lord. Now remember, the Lord's already told him you're not going to build this temple. This is his response to that edict from the prophet. No, this is not what we're doing, David. No, you can't do this. He responds to that. Who am I, O Lord God? What is the translation? Adonai Yahweh. So as he begins this response, he's beginning with an expression of total submission. Who, I, who am I, O Lord God, Yah, Adonai, Yahweh? And what is my house that you have brought me this far? And yet this was insignificant in your eyes, O Lord God, Adonai, Yahweh. For you have spoken also of the house of your servant concerning the distant future. And this is the custom of man, O Lord God, Adonai Yahweh. Remember, so every time he uses that expression, he is, he is sat down, he is low to the ground, he is, he is pleading with God, and, and yet he's very carefully, as though he was speaking to a king, very carefully wording everything. But with the words of total submission... Again, what more can David say to you? For you know your servant, O Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, for the sake of your word and according to your own heart, you have done all this greatness to let your servant know. For this reason, you are great, Lord God, Adonai Yahweh, for there is no one like you and there is no God, Elohim, there is no creator except you according to all that we have heard with our ears. So I want you to kind of see this response on the part of David when he was not getting his way in this case. And how respectful he was to the Lord and how careful and paced he was in his response to God, even though emotionally he was, he was greatly distressed by the decision and the finality of the decision. But David is speaking here from the posture of totally submitted. Wax on, wax off. Wax on, wax off. I don't like it. I don't care about it. But I am submitted. There is nowhere else to go. I am yours, God. I am here. He is speaking to his king, his Lord, Adonai, personal. So, you say, well... You know, as I'm laying this out, you're like, well, I don't know. The whole thing about believing and maybe I do check off the boxes. Do I really trust God? Am I active? Is my faith an active faith or is it a passive faith? Am I, you know, and it's possible somebody actually hears this message and maybe even have a moment of doubt, like, am I really saved? And sometimes people should have a doubt. It's so funny. People that are really saved will doubt if they're saved. And the people that aren't saved need to doubt they're saved. <laughs> You know, it's like, it's, it's like when I, in elementary school, I always remember the, the people, the kids that got all the extra points, they were the ones that already had hundreds. <laughs> and I'm like, and I remember a teacher relating that, I was like second grade or something like, why is it that all the students that don't need extra points are the ones that get all the extra points? And the students that really need the extra points, you don't want to work the extra to get the extra points. The ones that really need them, I've offered them for you, but you don't seem to want them, which is why you got lame grades to start with. So some of you that are teachers know what I'm talking about. So can you imagine the joy of lordship? And the way I like to put this is, can you imagine coming to Christ? All right, think of a bride. Bride is about to go down the aisle. I usually do a wedding or two every year. And usually if the bride is crying, it's because they're happy. <laughs> if they're not happy, it, it might be a, a day to counsel them to be a runaway bride. <laughs> there could be a situation where that could be merited. 
But imagine a bride who says to themselves, I'm getting married, but this is the saddest day of my life because the first thing I have to do is give up my name. Some of them don't give up their name, but 99% of brides, they take the name of the groom. Sarah gave up Spencer for Wilsey. Victoria Rand gave up her last name for Holland. That was a win. Good switch. <laughs> yes, that's right. And so, so you could see her going, I have to give up a great last name for maybe a name that's not as great. My last name is gone. I'm taking on this new shackle in my life. I'm giving up freedom to date other men. This is sad, very sad. I can't just stay out late with the girls whenever I want to. I have now a husband who expects me to give account. Where have you been? What are you doing? Why wasn't I invited? And worst of all, a joint bank account. Oh, so you can see the bride going down the aisle and she's like, this is the saddest day of my life. I can't do this. I can't do that. And I've got to wear the shackle of the ring the rest of my life so that everybody knows that I'm, I'm, I'm not available. So no more flirting, no more playing the game. It's over. But, but is that the way the bride sees it? Not at all. The bride sees it as it's all about, I love this person. I, I, I will even serve this person. I will even, I will follow them to the very end of their life. Even into old age, and we will love each other. And that bride looks forward to that, that lifetime journey that we're going to live together. And so none of those things they're giving up, so to speak, even matter. Because of their love is so great for their groom. And that's the way it is in following Christ. Yes, there's things we give up. Yes, there's things, but, but we have to understand when we submit to Him, when we follow Him, it is, a, it is a tremendous and wonderful joy. It's not like, you know, people often will struggle, should I give my life to Christ? And, and in fact, if they, if they struggle like this, it, it may be helpful because they need to understand they don't just, there is an actual decision and there is an actual sense of dying to self and you know, Lord, I want to serve you and follow you. And I may even give up some of my own ambitions, my own agenda, my own, see? But because of my love for you and my, my sense of indebtedness and understanding what you've done for me and that you laid your life down for me, that you spared nothing to reach me and to bring me in, into your kingdom, then all of it is a joy because you are a benevolent king. And that's our perspective. But oftentimes people will come to Christ with their arms folded and kind of like, well, I don't know. I'm going to have to give up this and give up that. And I've got some nasty habits and I've got this. And I just know God's going to want to deal with all this stuff. Right? So I guess I, you know, see. But, but we, we say, God, I love you. And I want to do what pleases you. It's not about all about what pleases me now. I, am, I have a, a Lord, I have Adonai Yahweh, my Lord whom I serve. I am submitted because I love you and because you are a benevolent king. So Jesus is, in every message I conclude with, Jesus is that name expressed in the name of God in the Old Testament. Jesus is Adonai Yahweh. So let's look at a couple passages. Philippians 2 says, And being found in appearance as a man, writing about Jesus, he humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even the death of the cross. Therefore God also has highly exalted him and given him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of those in heaven and of those on earth and of those under the earth and that every tongue should confess 
what? That Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So here you have this amazing, eloquent statement about the work of Christ and how he humbled himself and how he, he took upon the form of human, of human being and lowered himself to reach us. And then he says, but then the, the, the flip side of that is that he will be exalted. He will be exalted in a most phenomenal, striking fashion. He will be lifted up. And it says that every tongue will confess. Every knee will bow. And they will all say, everyone will say, and everyone will see it. It will be clear. Jesus Christ is Lord. This does not mean that everybody's going to get saved. I suppose the universalists would take this passage and say, well, it must mean that everyone, since everybody's going to kneel and everybody's going to bow down and everybody's going to confess, it must mean that everybody's saved. No, that's not it at all. It means whether they like it or not, they're going to acknowledge that he was the one. He was always the one. Even the one whom they rejected. Even those that have defied him and resisted his right to rule in their lives, they will all one day at some point acknowledge the truth about who Jesus is. He is Adonai Yahweh. He is my Lord. And he has the place of ultimate supremacy and rule. Interestingly, Psalm 110 is the most quoted psalm in the Bible. Psalm 110 is quoted numerous times in the New Testament, particularly verses 1 and 2. It's, it's considered, and by the early church, they considered it very much a cornerstone chapter of the prediction of Messiah and what he would come and do. And so the psalm, the first two verses read as so. The Lord Yahweh says to my Lord, okay, so what we have to understand the word, the first Lord, there's two Lords here. You read your Bible, it goes, the Lord said to my Lord. And that's kind of how we, we just see it in our English. It's how you see it in your Bible when you're reading it. The Lord says to my Lord. But what it actually says in Hebrew is, the Yahweh says to my Adonai. It's almost like a double possessive. Adonai is already a possessive term, my Lord. But then he says, the Lord, that is Yahweh, says to my Lord, my Adonai, my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. The Lord will stretch forth your strong scepter from Zion, saying, rule in the midst of your enemies, my Lord. So this particular verse is quoted in Hebrews. In fact, there's practically a whole chapter in Hebrews dedicated to Psalm 110. Peter uses this passage when he's preaching in the book of Acts. And here's an excerpt from Peter's message in the book of Acts. He says, David did not ascend into the heavens, but he himself says, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. From which he concludes, and he quotes another verse, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. I'm sorry, he's not quoting Old Testament verse, but he's, he's, it's a quote from Peter. Let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ. And he's building that statement on the previous statement from Psalm 110, verse 1 and 2. And what... Peter is saying is that Adonai, Yahweh, is Jesus. This is Jesus. And this passage written so many years before, 700 years before by David, was proclaiming Jesus. My Lord. And the question is, for all of us, if we could stand together i like the band to come. I want us to take a little, a little time and wait on the Lord here. Because, because this message of lordship is so important. And that we have, we have within our own hearts the sense of, 
submission to God and a desire to serve Him and follow Him. And so the question is, Adonai, is he, is he Adon to you, just a Lord, little L? Or is He Lord to you, capital L, Adonai, my Lord? And that's how we want to live our lives. We want to live our lives submitted to Him as my Lord. It's our Lord. It's all personal. Sometimes there'll be something that prevents someone from just really letting go and saying, I want to follow Him. Kind of that something that's standing between us and God. And I, I want to encourage you this morning. Perhaps there's something there that has become too important and too all-consuming. We need to keep perspective in light of whom we love, whom we serve, the Lord Himself. It's always possible there's someone here that hasn't fully come to fruition in their faith. Understanding, you know what? I think maybe up to this point it's kind of been more of a, a mental check boxes that I made. I don't know that I've really... You, you realize that there's people that can be a part of the church for decades and still see their faith as a, a list of check marks. Well, I believe the right thing, so I'm okay. And the realization that can come in so powerfully is that you know what? Checking off the right boxes is not enough. That is not saving faith. Don't wait 20 years to figure that out. wait a year to figure it out. Mm. Jesus. What I'd like to do as we sing and worship a moment, if, if you would like this morning to just reconsecrate posture before the Lord that He is Adonai He is my Lord and I'm here to serve Him. Sometimes we get distracted and we've got every kind of thought in our mind and all kinds of interests and, and, it can, and our affection and love for God can become easily buried. And so perhaps this morning is a day to just reaffirm, Lord, I'm here to serve You. I'm here to love You. I owe You everything. And if that's the case, I just, I want to encourage you as we're worshiping, just come down here and just, as, a, as an expression of Adonai, you are my king. I've submitted to you. And I want to follow you with my whole heart. And I just want to encourage that response this morning. Sometimes a simple response can be so powerful in a person's life when we just acknowledge it.
Yes, Lord. You yes, Lord. Have no yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Yes, Lord. Father, we just come to you this morning and we don't ever want to just revert somehow as Christians to just checking boxes and saying, I believe all the right things. But God, may we not lose our love, our passion, our deep, deep fire of desire to serve you and walk with you throughout our lifetime. Lord, each and every one of us, if we could just lift our hands to the Lord. We just want to acknowledge that we're yours and that you are the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Once again, we acknowledge you, Adonai Yahweh. Jesus is Lord. And we serve you. We can say that out loud. Lord, we serve you. my Lord cleanse me and wash me of anything that has grieved you in my life Lord I want to stay on track use me this morning for calling us to yourself. Lord, we thank you that you are so persistent to reach out to us, to call us, and to nudge us. Thank you for your, that you are a shepherd. We pray it all in Jesus' name. 